From religion to wrestling, gumbo to grits, politics to poetry, and all things southern in between, this is Take on the South. Produced by the Institute for Southern Studies and hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina, Take on the South examines the highs and lows of the American South, examines the truths and fictions of the country's most distinctive region, and picks the brains of some of its most accomplished students. To understand the South, you need to take it on, and that's what we'll be doing. Join us as we Take on the South. Today we examine a storied past, but one oddly lacking a detailed story. Until now. This is the story of the first South Carolina Volunteers. My name is Mark Smith. I'm the director of the Institute for Southern Studies at the University of South Carolina. And this is Take on the South. It is my honor, my privilege to welcome my colleague and my friend, Professor Valinda Littlefield of the University of South Carolina, a colleague in the history department, And Val has been undertaking what is arguably the most extensive excavation of the first South Carolina Volunteers, really, um, since its formation during the Civil War. Val, welcome to Take on the South. Thank you. Our pleasure to have you. So let's begin with a quick overview of who were the first South Carolina Volunteers. It's a regiment that was formed uh, August of 1862, It is a volunteer infantry because they were not paid. And they become the first officially recognized African-American unit of the Union Army during the Civil War. And by November, they had a thousand men. These are formerly enslaved men from South Carolina, Low Country, Georgia, and I've read other places, also the Georgia Sea Islands, but also Florida. And so these are people who uh, took their freedom and volunteered to fight for others. And so that is the image, and they, they are formed from 1862 to 1866. In February 9th, uh, they're disbanded. Mm-hmm. So they have arguably been overshadowed by the Massachusetts 54th historically. Yes. Courtesy of glory and a whole lot of ink that has rightfully been spilt over that topic. Yes. Do you think that that has... That's one explanation for why the first South Carolina volunteers are relatively obscure. And of course, historians know of the regiment, but most people don't. And that's really what you're trying to do here is, is resurrect them and profile them. Is it largely because of this, this undue focus uh, on the 54th? Well, it's largely, I came about this project by uh, President Kaslin received an email. And he got an email from two, I consider them semi-retired generals. Uh, One's a lieutenant uh, and one's a colonel. One lives in Germany, one lives in Beaufort. And they became fascinated by the first South Carolina volunteers and started doing some research. And they are the first to say, we're not historians and we would like some help. But they're also very passionate about their mission and there are some things that they want to do and we can talk a little bit more about that. But they sent the email to uh, President Caslin. He checked with the Dean of Arts and Sciences, our interim Dean, Joel Samuels, and Joel uh, appointed two people to start looking at this. And you're looking at one, Val Littlefield, and the other one is Mark Smith. Well, I I have a a minor role in this, a supportive role, if you will, Um, but I'm absolutely delighted to be involved in the project. And, you know, this is a story that does need to be told in in extraordinary detail. Could you say a few words, Val, about some of the figures that people might well know that are almost household names, really, um, certainly in the historical profession, certainly in Southern culture, that were actually involved quite intimately with the first South Carolina volunteers, but, but people tend not to know that. True. When you think of people like Susie Taylor, we do know a little, we do know something about her because she left, she wrote and published her memoir. Uh, She was a laundress at first, and she had family members who were part of the regiment. She also became a nurse. Um, And so we have her story both during the Civil War, but also into Reconstruction, the Reconstruction period, where she goes back to Georgia. But she spends the Civil War years in that Buford area working with the first uh, unit, first volunteer unit. We also know about Harriet Tubman, who was part of, uh, she served as a nurse for them. The other people uh, we know that Robert Smalls recruited uh, members of this regiment. Uh, We do also know from um, Charlotte Fortin's diary, which is one of those we're looking at, re-looking at, shall we say, to see what information she can provide. 
talked about the 33rd, 33rd. They become the 33rd later. We also have Higginson, who left his memoir, and he goes into detail about the Gullah language, about their songs, and, and those that kind of information. So there's certainly people who left records of them. Prince Rivers is a person that we know more about, who Higginson praised, uh, and Higginson, I mean, Rivers, is one of the co- one of the founders of Aiken County. He becomes a judge, and he also is a legislator. Fascinating figure, brilliant person. But then you get the end of Reconstruction, and he goes back to doing what he was doing as an enslaved person, which is driving a horse and buggy. You know, that's one of the interesting things that, that has come out of this project is that there are a lot of people who want to recognize people who have made a difference, like a Prince Rivers, Susie Taylor, Harriet Tubman, both in Georgia and South Carolina. We don't know where Prince Rivers is buried. And so we there are people looking, trying to figure out where is Prince Rivers' grave. They want to put a marker on his grave. So, so interestingly here, that there is a rich, deep repository of information. I mean, we have really the, the um, only African-American woman to publish a Civil War memoir as part of this story. Yes. We have people involved in the Civil War and Reconstruction. We have Northern abolitionists. We have Southern slaves. This is really a microcosm of American society during the Civil War and Reconstruction. And while we'll always have some holes, Val, I think that the depth of this story is going to be very obvious by the time you've gathered the information, the documents, um, and we will probably have a mini archive as a result. Is that part of the aim here of, of what, we, what we're doing? Is, is part of the aim to have an archive available to people? It is. And one of the things that we first did this summer, we spent the summer working on this and we're still working on it. It's it's going to be a long process, but it's a fun process, I must admit. But one of the things that we did this summer was to look at what the generals were asking President Caslin for. And they wanted help in documenting certain things. Uh, they wanted help in basically finding information, more information about them. And how do we advocate for educating others about this regiment uh, and other people involved. And so with funding uh, from the from the dean through Institute for African American Research, African American Studies Program, Southern Studies, also administrative help and graduate student help, we were able to spend this summer digging. And the graduate students at the Institute looked at two books. One was Susie Taylor's book and the other one was Higginson's. And so they documented everything that they said about the first volunteer unit. And then newly minute PhD Melissa DeVelvis scoured the internet and other places looking for what what's out there on the first regiment. What what do we have? What do we know that we can put our hands on? And so she put together a very good document that we can now go pull that information. We're going to work with Southern Studies to get that in, all both those information no, materials into the database, and other people will have access to it. What we're also planning to do is to work with the, it's, it's called the Second Founding, which is out of Beaufort, South Carolina, which Billy Kaiselin started. And he's working with the Park Service. And so there are all these connections that are happening that's making this work really, really well. So in an in a interesting and sort of fortuitous way, a, a happy accident, really. A yes. conversation from a, a retired military official in Germany to a former president of the University of South Carolina then leads to opening up what is a dormant set of documents, a treasure trove, really. And you're entirely right. We Once we've collected as much information, documentary information as we can, then we're going to host it on the Southern Studies website and share it with other people. But I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of place because place matters here a great deal. And there are two kinds of places, aren't there? Because in the first instance, we have enslaved people gathered from not just South Carolina, but Georgia, and probably parts of Florida. And that, of course, really mirrors uh, David Hunter, General David Hunter's initial proclamation where he says, I'm declaring free all enslaved people in South Carolina, (laughs) Georgia, and Florida. Right. And, of course, Lincoln, you know, doesn't like this. He's like, we can't do this. Um, (laughs) But in a way, the articulation of that, that proclamation from Hunter kind of animated people and sort of perhaps led to this creation. I think 
Arguably, it was Robert Smalls who goes to Washington and persuades Lincoln, we need this. And I think within a couple of weeks of him meeting, Lincoln accedes to it and says, yes, yes. we're going to have this first South Carolina volunteers. So in one way, it's very expansive geographically. But in another way, this is very much a Beaufort, South Carolina story. It is. Yes, very much so. In in the sense, I've actually spent part of the summer in, in Beaufort, went to Port Royal, went to the site, and I also went to the area, uh, Billy took me to the area where you can still see some of the housing uh, that these enlisted men would have lived in. Uh, some of them are falling down, but others have been repaired, restored in their natural glory, shall we say. But also in that area, it's still predominantly African-American, but that is a rich area to then start making sure that people in Beaufort know about this particular area, that people outside of Beaufort know about this particular area. And so there's, there's so much that can be done with that history, and it is extremely rich, and it is South Carolina's history. Do, do you think people in Beaufort um, know about this? Not a lot of them. Mm, Some do. Uh, I actually, the generals gave a talk this summer, and so I attended that talk, and it was pouring rain. But there were about 80 people at that talk, and a lot of them had questions. They had not heard of it uh, before. And so people are hungry for the information, and it is also the second founding, one of the things that they're interested in is making sure that students can now look at those stories. We don't know who's there, who, who are the descendants? Who's there who has that tidbit of information, you know, hidden somewhere or in, either in their memory or in their house? We don't know. And so when you get students involved in researching the history of the landscape where they are, you really can get them more interested in history, but also soft skills, but hard skills as well. When, when you think about the potential for this. Yeah, so this is oddly and interestingly a kind of crowdsourcing for students who are going to help generate this information yes. in, a, in an effort to satisfy their own hunger. Yes, right? yes. And, and then they're going to be producing information that can be consumed by other people. And it's really your guiding hand here that, that's sort of shaping the trajectory of that conversation. If you had a wish list, Val, what would this project look like and when? It is a long-term project because I see it when you're educating anyone, it has to be long-term from generation to generation. So I see this going on, you know, when I've long shuffle off the mortal coil, shall we say. But my wish list would be that we think of it as a long-term project and we do as much as we possibly can with the time that we have. In doing that, we will be pulling together all these different groups of people. USC people from, from the archaeology department to the USC press to the Institute from African American Studies to AFAM to Southern Studies. But then you look at Buford. You've got USC Buford. You have the second founding that's there. Then you've got that Georgia connection. We haven't tapped into the Florida connection yet. Uh, we just found out that the University, uh, University of Georgia person is writing, actually University of Georgia Press, is about to publish his graphic novel on Prince Rivers. Well, we also found out that there is a journalist in Aiken who has been researching Prince Rivers for a long time. And there's another historian somewhere in the north who's doing research on Prince Rivers. So what I, my wish list is to pull all these people together and say, how do we make a difference? Whether it be making sure that there are markers, making sure that, that people can see they're not hidden markers. How can we advocate for better educating people on the contributions that the first volunteer made? And I'm not just thinking of the first volunteer as the enslaved men who fought. I'm also thinking of the ordinary people and others like Robert Smalls and Susie Taylor uh, and Charlotte Fortin and, and Laura Town and Ellen Murray. So I'm, I'm thinking this. I'm thinking of this much larger. And what does it mean when you're when you're reading Taylor's account of the first volunteer letting enslaved people know that they have their freedom? You are now free. Those those reactions are, were captured. We have those written. That's a much larger picture than just them fighting. 
They're doing so much more. And, and, and then what happens to them? Are, do they all become a Prince Rivers? Or what happens to the others and, and following those trails? That's my wish list, is to find out as much as we possibly can about the people who have played some part in that, that regiment. That, that is both noble and poetic. I mean, we, we have the formation of the regiment, which brought together lots of different constituencies, enslaved men, enslaved women, northern abolitionists, Washington, D.C. And now we have a similar trajectory. We're bringing people from all over the place together to essentially retell this story in a way that's robust, sensitive, balanced and thorough. Thorough being probably the key here. Yes. You, you raise a really interesting question there, Val. I mean, I really, really like this distinction between sort of military history and then the kind of social history of what the South Carolina Volunteers represents and what it does. And I think if they are known, they're, they're, they're known largely through the military lens, which is an invaluable thing to be sure. But you're raising a different almost philosophical question about the ultimate American question, what does it mean to be free? And this was a question that the South Carolina Volunteers deliberated upon and added meaning to. From what you've looked at so far, what would what were some of the litmus tests of freedom for these folks? Um, they were actively fighting for their freedom. How did they know that they'd got it, and what did it mean to them when they when they did uh, achieve freedom? Yeah, I, you know, I think probably Prince Rivers is the best example that we have of somebody who under, who certainly understood what freedom meant. Uh, and when you think about freedom. And again, I'm looking at it from that social context. You're also thinking about a person who is enslaved. And this wonderful myth is that people of color, enslaved people, are dumb. Both he and Robert Smalls blow that one out of the water. But that they're not capable of being free. They're not capable of enjoying freedom. And these are people who prove to you they're very capable of being free. They understand what freedom means. Number one, they took their freedom, and that's a risk in itself. Once they take their freedom, they're putting their lives on the line again to fight for a country that hasn't yet decided whether or not they're going to free them, especially in the very beginning. And so they understand what freedom means, I would argue, better than those who are fr- who are free. Yeah, I think that there's a really resonant point there. And, and freedom took so, does a, so many valences. I mean, from very small things like the ability to move through space, right? Uh, so the actual formation of this first South Carolina volunteers was bringing people together through space that they weren't technically allowed to to move to through because yes. they had to have a pass to leave right. the plantation. Right. So the very act of forming this was mm-hmm. an act of or an exercise of freedom. Yes. And then, of course, after the Civil War, you have these very valid claims for property, land in particular. And it's always struck me that these claims were ultimately maybe the most Jeffersonian of claims because it was Jefferson that said, to have full freedom, you need land to exercise your autonomy. And in a way, the last Jeffersonians um, were the formerly enslaved folks who are making exactly the same argument with the same kind of intellectual heft. As you rightly point out, this is what Smalls et al. are saying. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a kind of intellectual history here too that reinvigorates our understanding of the meaning of freedom. And in a way, it is that interrogation of that question that I think is going to have the longest lasting echo from this project. Can you tell us a little bit more, Val, about the second founding project in Beaufort? Well, that is a project started by Billy Kaiserlin um, and his brother, but mainly by Billy. And what they want to do is look at reconstruction through Beaufort. That's where it starts. You've got the um, Port Royal experiment, the Union soldiers have Port Royal by 1862, and you have all sorts of things going on. You have education. Uh, you have you have a community that is combating the stereotypical images of African Americans, from handling money to getting an education to working the land to owning the land. All of that's going on in that space. That is where Reconstruction starts, and so it's a perfect. 
it's, it's an absolutely perfect place. And so you have, uh, as mayor, Billy worked with the Park Service and, and, and others and federal government in making sure that that area was recognized as the place. And it is the only reconstruction Park Service location. So it has a formal designation. And so that allows Second Founding to do what with that space? That allows the Second Founding to cooperate with the Park Service to look at how do you educate people about reconstruction? How do you research this particular area and enhance what the Park Service is already doing? So part of the Second Founding, they're looking at K through 12. They're looking at the larger public. How do you make sure that what the Park Service, they're there, we have them now, but how do we enrich? Is there also a protective function uh, for that federal recognition? That is to say, South Carolina, and especially places like Beaufort, are growing exponentially. It's a very fast-growing area. Lots of old houses are torn down to make way for new ones. Roads are reconfigured. Monuments are sometimes missed or buried. Is there some way that that federal recognition protects those that material environment. Definitely. And, you know, when you've got park rangers <laughs> who are overseeing territory, it, you know, it just, it makes all the difference. And that's what the council and the former mayor, and I'm sure the current mayor want it, is that you do have that kind of protection. You, you have this rich history. You do not want to lose it. And yes, people are moving into Beaufort like crazy. You know, it's, it's not large. It's, it's still small, but I do see more and more people coming there. Yeah, so you do have to protect certain right. things. I think that's entirely right. And I, I think that preservation instinct is absolutely essential to the educative instinct, right? If you can educate people, you need to preserve you in need order to preserve. To yes. <laughs> or, yes. Or it's simply just documents at that's that point, That's exactly isn't it? right. You need to be able to go to that community and say, these are the kinds of houses that the first regiment would have lived in. This is the space that they would have been allowed to buy property in and, and look at where it's, you know, where it is, uh, but also to look at the kind of houses that they lived in, but to also look at the other things that they've done within the Buford area. And I, I do think that's extremely important, but you're absolutely right. You have to preserve it. So um, just briefly, uh, because I know that some people do know the military history of, of this regiment, is there anything especially noteworthy that you've come across that they did militarily during the Civil War? They did fight in, in some battles, but not a lot of battles. But there were a couple of battles, and I am drawing a blank on the two battles that, that they fought. One was St. James, was on St. James Island. They end up going to Florida as well, fighting some battles in Florida. But for the most part... They are the ones who, when you think of, you know, a Harriet Tubman as a spy or, or you think of a Robert Smalls being able to tell the military where certain things are, you have locals, you, you have Gullah people who know the land. That We often don't think about that kind of support that you can give the military that can make a difference whether that battle is won or not. And so I think that's part of the reason that Glory gets the glory, uh, the, the, you know, the movie Glory, that the 54th Regiment gets a lot of the glory because they did fight more battles. You, you do have certain battles that just stick with you. But the other thing is you also have famous, the Douglas's sons were part of this. So all of that plays into it. All of that makes a difference. But you should not underestimate. My argument is you should not underestimate the kind of behind the scene information that's being provided to the military to win a war. They, they knew the land. They that, knew that the land. Absolutely essential to any military yes. exercise. Yes. As you rightly say, it's often difficult to see what, what the precise military event was. But my thinking when it comes to military history is that that's precisely where we need to be looking. We need to be looking at the subtleties, not always the glory. Yes. Um, but the day-to-day -day sort of military experience, the lived experience of a war, uh, wasn't glorious. No, it, it was hard. Yeah. It was um, brutal. Yes. And it required a keen intelligence, knowing the land, knowing when, knowing where. And I think you're right. I think that the South Carolina volunteers knew that. The Union Army knew that knew they that. knew that. Yes. And then ultimately, the poetry of this is that you're now going to be telling people what they knew, and they need to know that. Yes. Val, is there anything else you'd like to add? 
I can't think of anything else other than the fact that this is a rich history. It's a South Carolina history, but it also needs to be a nationally known history. And I am excited about the potential. I am excited about the people I'm working with, and uh, I'm looking forward to what we find. Found Littlefield, thank you so much. You have educated us, and Take on the South remains in your debt. From religion to wrestling, gumbo to grits, politics to poetry, and all things Southern in between, this is Take on the South. Produced by the Institute for Southern Studies and hosted by the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina, Take on the South examines the highs and lows of the American South, examines the truths and fictions of the country's most distinctive region, and picks the brains of some of its most accomplished students. To understand the South, you need to take it on, and that's what we'll be doing. Join us as we Take on the South.